All right, um, we'll get started. Peace, everyone. My name is Jenna Hamid, and I am the programs manager at Center for Book Arts, where we are settled on unceded Lenape territory. I'm especially grateful for this program this afternoon. We'll hear from Shanna M. Griffin, Latasha Diggs, and Bryce Detroit, three artists born and raised in majority Black cultural centers, New Orleans, Harlem, and Detroit. They'll each share their experiences in artistic production, reflecting the current realities of displacement in their communities. This conversation will navigate speakers' politically driven creative practices in the intersections with community building and land-based initiatives. This event is part of a larger series curated by Shawnee Peters and Joseph Collier of the Black School. The Black School was founded in 2016 as an experimental art school teaching Black and POC students and allies to become agents of change through art workshops on radical Black politics and public interventions that address local community needs. With socially engaged artists, designers, and educators working at the intersections of K through 12 and university, teaching art, design, and activism. All, all of the Black School programming is structured around core principles of Black love, self-determination, and wellness. Before passing the mic to our curators, I'd like to personally acknowledge land-based struggles within unceded lands of Turtle Island and honor the work being done on the ground to resist forced displacement on both micro scale within neighborhood communities, cityscapes, from Detroit to Harlem to New Orleans and beyond, and on a macro scale, identifying the transnational ties of police state apparatuses, thus building international solidarity movements bound by struggle. From the river to the sea, we're not free until we're all free. I'll stop here to let the conversation continue with our curators and panelists. Thank you again for joining us. I'll now turn it over to Shani Peters and Joseph. Thank you so much, Jenna. Thank you so much for um, the introduction, for helping us to organize um, this series of conversations and for um, the acknowledgements, the land acknowledgements, the, the global climate that um, you know, is, is happening now and, and always, but particularly um, what's happening in Palestine right now is so relevant to everything um, that we're here to talk about today. Um, and with that, we want to definitely acknowledge um, the land that we are calling from. Um, very happy to be um, now permanently in New Orleans, Louisiana, what is now known as New Orleans, Louisiana, um, but a, a space that has been occupied by many indigenous groups before us. So uh, y'all bear with me. I've been a resident here. I've been Zooming here for three months now. Um, but I'm gonna do my best to, to begin to acknowledge those people. And I think I'm gonna learn more about how to best do that um, in this conversation. So uh, we're calling from land of Chittimacha, Atacapa, Cado, Ch Choctaw, Homa, Natchez, and Tunica people, also known as the land of Bal Balbancha. Um, and with that, Joseph is going to give us our introduction for today's talk. Okay. So first, I want to thank Jenna, Devin, and the Center for Book Arts for inviting us to curate this series. Um, this is the second of four conversations on Black radical legacies in, in contemporary art. As the Black school, we have a deep faith in the capacity of art to transform the world around us. And we believe the artists we have assembled here today share in that belief. But in order to harness our true potential, we have to radically reconsider the assumptions we have about the role of the artists in relation to their community. Community is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but community is not just a place to extract ideas. At the Black School, we believe community is a practice in reciprocity. The state of our community is not measured by the success of its individuals, but by the well being of the community as a whole. In my experience traveling between Harlem, Detroit, and New Orleans, and other Black urban centers and centrally located Black neighborhoods across this country, I am saddened by the trends of displacement that we are all experiencing. And on the other hand, I am inspired by the trends of Black spatial resistance I have witnessed in all of these communities. We're here today to share 
to share some of the tools we believe can fight displacement and help build the thriving communities we all want to live in. In his speech message to, to the grassroots, Brother Malcolm says, revolution is based on land and land is the basis of all independence. And land, land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. So today, let's have a revolutionary discussion about land. But before we get started, allow me to thank today's panelists, Shana M. Griffin, Latasha N. Nevada Diggs, and Bryce Detroit. Now Shani is gonna read each panelist's bio, then we'll start to talk with five minute intros from each artist. So I'm gonna read the bios in the order uh, that our speakers will be presenting those intro presentations. So beginning with Latasha in Nevada Diggs, a writer, vocalist, and performance sound art, uh, performance slash sound artist. Latasha is the author of Twerk, Belladonna 2013. Diggs has presented and performed at California Institute of Arts, El Museo del Barrio, the Museum of Modern Art, the Walker Art Center, and at festivals including Explore the North Festival, Leeuwarden, Netherlands, Hekaye Festival, Abu Dhabi, International Poetry Festival of Copenhagen, Ocean Space, Venice, International Poetry Festival of Romania, Questions of Will, Slovakia, Poesie Festival, Berlin, and the 2015 Venice Biennial. As an independent curator, artistic director, and producer, Diggs has presented events at BAM Cafe, Black Rock Coalition, El Museo del Barrio, Lincoln Center Outdoors, and the David Rubenstein Atrium. Diggs has received a 2020 CD award for poetry from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts, a Whiting Award 2016, and a National Endowment for Art Literature Fellowship in 2015 as well as grants and fellowships from the Howard Foundation, Cave Canham, Creative Capital, New York Foundation for the Arts, and the US-Japan Friendship Commission, among others. She lives in Harlem. Bryce Detroit, born 1979 Detroit, is the multidisciplinary Afrofuturist music artist, storyteller, activist, and pioneer uh, of entertainment justice. As a cultural designer, he is a national award-winning music producer and curator. Through his social practice, Bryce Detroit demonstrates the power of using music, entertainment, arts, and native legacies to preserve, produce, and promote new diasporic African narratives, cultural literacies, and cooperative neighborhood-based economics. Bryce Detroit is a 2020 Harvard University Council of Arts Award recipient, a 2019 New Museum Idea City Fellow, a 2018 Race Forward, Rinku Sen Innovation Awardee, as well as a 2017 Knights Award uh, Challenge Award winner, excuse me, Knights Arts Challenge Award winner. Bryce Detroit was also selected as a music curator and lead performer for the 10th uh, Street ATN International Design Biennial, representing Detroit as the UNESCO City of Design. A prominent community activist and advocate, Bryce Detroit grows intersectional, self-determined communities as a founding member of Oakland Avenue Artists Coalition, co-founder of Detroit Community Wealth Fund, consultant and center at Center of Community-Based Enterprises, international delegate for the East Michigan Environmental Action Coalition, and founding member of the Art Activism Collective Frontline Detroit, supporting water shifts and cross-generational movement building throughout Detroit. Whew, so y'all see why we have brought these folks together and you're not even ready for Ms. Shana M. Griffin uh, is a feminist activist, researcher, applied sociologist, artist, geographer, abolitionist, and mother. Her practice is interdisciplinary and undisciplinary. Centering historic inquiry rooted in black feminist thought, spatial imaginaries, and organizing traditions. Her work exists across the fields of sociology, geography, land use planning, and socially engaged art, and within movements challenging urban displacement, carcerality, reproductive control, and gender-based violence. Shane engages in research, organizing projects, and art practices that attend to the lived experiences of the Black diaspora. Centering the, the particular experiences of Black women most vulnerable to the violence of poverty, incarceration, polluted environments, reproductive legislation, economic exploitation, and housing discrimination. 
Shana is the interim executive director of Antenna, a multidisciplinary visual and literary arts organization, the founder of Punctuate, a recently established feminist research art and activist initiative foregrounding the embodied aesthetics and practices of black feminist epistemolo epistemological traditions to address the intersecting forms of everyday violence and subjectivity black women, their families and communities experience. Creator of Displaced, a multimedia feminist and public history project that chronicles the institutionalization of spatial residential segregation through the violence of racial slavery and displacement in New Orleans and co-founder of Jane's Place Neighborhood Sustainability Initiative, the first community land trust in New Orleans. Shana is a 2021 Creative Capital awardee, a June Bug Productions 2020-21 uh, John O'Neill Cultural Awards Fellow. She is a 2020-21 visual artist in residence at the Contemporary Arts Center New Orleans, presenting studio work as part of Solo's exhibition and new work showcases by CAC artists in residence, featuring displacing blackness, cartographies of violence, extraction, and disposability of the displaced project. Shana holds a master's of arts in sociology and two bachelor's of arts degrees in history and sociology. You can learn more about Shana's work at shanamgriffin.com. We are so honored to have you all here. So excited to hear from you individually and then collectively. And let's get to it. Uh, Latasha, will you please share with us uh, a bit more? Sure. How you doing, everybody? Osia, Dogwada, Latasha, and Nevada Diggs. Um, much love to Shani and Joe as well as the Center for Book Arts for having me, I'm gonna get into this. So, um, so let me tell you a story. Uh, next page. This is my muse. Her head is tilted in the still. Her arms are crossed. She has a smirk that reads to me, seriously, this is bullshit. Who is this white man and why is he filming me? The still from an Albert Maisel's film documents the relocation of one family from substandard housing into a newly renovated apartment on 114th between Adam Clayton and Frederick Douglass. Since 1964, there has been another urban renewal relocation project on 114th. Does my muse still live there? Next slide. This is Second Canaan Baptist Church. It was across from a small traffic island where the unveiling of the Malcolm X stamp, or was it the unveiling of Malcolm X Boulevard was held in 1999. The island is at the tip of what was once an Indian trail called Wekweskeek. The Wekweskeek is one of several Algonquin tribes. These include the Munsi, a branch of the Lenape, Wappinger, and Mohican. The word Wekweskeek is believed to mean place of the bark kettle, or birch bark by the water. This Indian trail is the border between West and Central Harlem. I occasionally argue that Lenox is the true border between West and East Harlem and not Fifth Avenue. Wekweskeek is St. Nicholas Avenue, named by the Dutch who settled there, named after St. Nicholas Amira. It is New York State Bike Route 9. City bike rentals do not occupy any strip of St. Nicholas, as far as I know. Next slide. This is what the Second Canaan Baptist Church was before it was the Second Canaan Baptist Church, the Yiddish Lenox Theater. Thomas LaRue, AKA the Black Cantor, performed here in the 1920s. A native of New Jersey, LaRue toured the provincial Yiddish vaudeville circus circuit. He is also known as Little Moses. Next slide. This is the Lenox Theater in 1941. Next slide. Any place can be a church. The couch is a church. One does not need attend a religious space to be one with God. Granted, there is something disturbing about the slow, steady, and swift demolition of a black church that was a Yiddish theater, therefore in its entire history, a holy place. 
Something is sacrilegious about a developer's behavior towards black churches struggling to keep the lights on. And when overhearing Israeli businessmen sell condo units under the table to foreign benefactors, this is a true story. It took place in a small cafe below a condo across from a new condo. The cafe is now gone, as is the Korean dry cleaner. The owners could, not long, could no longer pay the rent during the shutdown of non-essential businesses, nor could they reason with the business owner, a billionaire based in China. Next slide. This is Second Canaan Baptist Church now. There are condo units above the church, above its completion, upon its completion, the temporary shelter for homeless families next door decided to build an extension on the roof. The extension now blocks the penthouse view overlooking Central Park. During the pandemic, the shelter was emptied, the units were renovated, and is now a shelter for six single men. Did you hear the story about the naked, mentally ill man who tried to dance with a guy on the two, three platform, pushed the guy onto the tracks, knocked him cold, and then a good Samaritan, a veteran, jumped onto the tracks. The naked man followed and got himself electrocuted on the third rail, but naked. That happened here, near the tip of St. Nicholas, on that traffic island and skater park. Next slide. This was Carlos Pacheco. We met at DDC, a program at Columbia University for disadvantaged high school students. We got to live in the dorms. I had a pet iguana. Next slide. This is cursive written by Carlos. This is not his best example. Maybe his gift had to do with strict parents from Haiti and Puerto Rico. Maybe he genuinely enjoys cursive. Cursive, good cursive is rare these days. True story. Schomburg writes to Langston Hughes regarding the work of Cuban writer Nicholas Guillen. He writes that it is important for the American Negro to know there is a shared experience with the Spanish speaking countries surrounding an Uncle Tom. And on Amsterdam, bordering what some considered an extension of Harlem, Carlos sprouts mango, jackfruit, Haitian cherry, and almond trees from his mother's public housing apartment. Next slide. This is Carlos Pacheco now. Case number 2021-28-1390, as reported to the 28th precinct a block away from the Harriet Tubman statue, coincidentally on another traffic island bordering Central and West Harlem, St. Nicholas and Frederick Douglass Boulevard. The sculpture was created by sculptor Alison Saar, the daughter of Betty Saar, an artist and activist during the civil rights movement and the black arts movement. Would Harriet had dragged him to freedom or shot him dead to save others? Swing low. How low can you really go? How much do we know or not know? St. Nicholas is the patron saint of sailors, merchants, repentant thieves, prostitutes, children, infidels, brewers, pawnbrokers, and unmarried people. St. Nicholas evolved into Santa Claus, AKA Santa Claus in New Amsterdam. The CVS on 116th sells life-size black Santa Claus. Some wear Hawaiian shirts. Is Santa a member of the Boogaloos? St. Nicholas was once an Indian trail. Next slide. This is Miss Martha. She suffers from dementia. She was my neighbor. She moved 20 years ago to 94th and Amsterdam, yet she returns and climbs five flights to her former apartment. She walks here every day, rain or shy, and often ill clothed. The social fabric of Harlem on this block is disappearing. No, been disappearing. Is anyone left for her? Is it all on me to remember her, this church, this aspiring artist? Staring at the blinking tab, I tilt my head. 
This is apartment 5FW, fifth floor. This was a one bedroom apartment. This was home to her, her son, two sons and husband. Next slide. This was her kitchen. Next slide. This was her former bathroom. Next slide. This was her living room and bedroom. The apartment ends at the small window to the left. In the far back is former apartment 5RW. The Austrian owner plans to make this a luxury three bedroom, two and a half bathroom apartment. The architects are a German man and a Chinese woman. She receives resources from the city as she is a minority and a woman. They believe in using sustainable materials. Next slide. This is the Eastern American coastal pigeon. Miss Jackie, a retired teacher, and I take walks through Central Park. We walk the length of the mare, three quarters of a mile. We detour into the North Woods. I began feeding the birds during the winter, and Miss Jackie joined me. Miss Jackie wants a hundred birds to feed from her palm. We serve the birds a blend of crushed nuts and seeds and salted. I befriend a tough woodpecker, a red billy woodpecker, woodpecker, a white breasted nut hatch, and a red tail blackbird. A brown thrasher crashes the party. On our block resides plenty of sparrows, morning doves, and blue jays. The pigeons are relegated to the corner with the seagulls. Sparrows don't come to your hands, I tell Miss Jackie. Miss Jackie thinks the sparrows will come to us. They eat chicken bones, I tell Miss Jackie. To prove it, I throw down my mix beside and ignore a tree. They come, they study, they never eat. The nuts remain until the rats take aim. A day later, we saw a sparrow nibbling on a chicken bone. Do the sparrows and pigeons a 111th in St. Nicholas understand themselves to be cannibals? Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Latasha. Mm -hmm. Bryce, can you please share? Okay, are we? Yep, there we go. So this is me going over to a Google slide presentation. You all are seeing all this. All right, here we go. So peace. I am Bryce Detroit. And uh, I'm going to be speaking about my most recent project, uh, the road work project and the first series, Hood Closed to Gentrifiers. First, I'm going to put a timer on because Bryce will talk for sure. So let me get this. It's five to seven minutes. So six minutes. Is that? Thumbs up. All right. Six minutes. Six minutes and six seconds because we like stuff like that. All right. Boom. So. First, I'm going to go to this slide. This is a handsome young diasporic African who is native to Detroit. Um, this is him again. And um, from boy to man, I'm starting with these images because of the underlying theme of this project, road work, the tagline as above, so below, on earth as it is in heaven. So. First off, just want to name or acknowledge fully that in my practice and my, my principle for me regarding all art practices, cultural production practices, our practice should stem from our own, the fullness of our self-identity. So it should stem from the way that we see beauty in the world and want to project beauty in the world, the way that we love and value our the multitude of our intelligences, um, the way that we love uh, our own self-identity and the way that we qualify 
our own lived experiences, um, our work should come from there, which requires us to be rooted at all times in self in a particular kind of way. So, boom. Having said that, going back to this road work, road work simply speaks to this. Each one of us in our lifetime is on a path. Our life's path, we can talk about it in terms of our life's journey, but regardless, we are on this road that we call our lifespan. And on this road, we do have certain work that we're doing. Uh, the work as above, that speaks to the work in our internal environment, in our heaven. The work of cultivating self-identity, the work of designing um, the way that we actually want to perceive the world, uh, coming up with the way that we want to qualify the things in our environment and actually determining the way that we want to interact with our built environment. Like that work, and it's the quality of that work, the work of making sure that, especially for diasporic African and indigenous peoples, the work of ensuring that we actually have a positive, loving self-image that is imagining itself um, engaging in reality, in society. So do it because this society is so replete with narratives, um, negative narratives that qualify us as these very perverted, distorted uh, characters in a settler colonial novel. So boom, that's the as above. It's the quality of the work that we do, nurturing ourself, um, healing ourselves, holding ourselves as whole. That quality of work, that will determine the quality of our reality manifesting. So that's the as above, so below. On Bryce's path, just on his journey in life, um, one of the things that we're very in contact with is the, this narrow range of um, points of identity, self-identity for diasporic African people. Uh, in that narrow range of self-identity, there is a direct correlation to the built environment. The, the, the identities that we were given from a settler colonial society correlate to uh, socio-political and socio-economic uh, systems, weaponized economic systems. So the criminal identity, how that correlates to the prison industrial complex, uh, how the welfare recipient identity correlates to the state apparatus in a particular way. And regardless to the point, it's these structures, it's the architect and environment that is qualifying us in ways that are not rooted in our own ancestral identity. Um, and it is also this built environment that is reinforcing uh, through economic cultural erasure, through architectural um, erasure of cultural monuments, of neighborhoods that black and brown people have lived in for 30 and 40 years. It's through these, uh, the economic violence of redlining. It's through the legislated violence um, that allows for policies like emergency management to rape an entire city um, of its economic infrastructure that supports black people like Detroit and then replaces that um, with blight, quote unquote blight, which is a form of architectural violence and then ushers in um, as an act of class warfare, a whole new population uh, of people that are no longer indigenous to the place and it's in that ushering in, the architectural violence of ushering in, where structures, cultural markers begin to be erased. And that is what has effectively created uh, cultural amnesia, as well as very, very real um, disconnection from land and place. So my work, uh, this entire project, we got 34 seconds left. So boom, land is playing. With the hood closed and gentrifiers, on one point, it's bringing forward accessible language so folks can articulate more clearly, like this is my politic. I'm actually straight on business as usual. That's what the hood closed means. Hood closed means that we're closed to conventional top-down ways of engaging our community um, because we have created self-determined ways of bringing resources in. We've created self-determined ways of designing and architecting our environment. So because of that, and 
situations like the North End, Detroit neighborhood, we've been doing this for decades plus now. So because we have our own models out here and we have created new mechanisms and channels for resourcing ourselves and designing our environments, and we can effectively say, fuck that shit. The hood is closed to conventional business as usual. Cause that's really what we're saying. And boom, so we confront by saying, oh, sign, we're directing our own traffic, road closed, hood closed. At the, and, and on the other end, my timer has gone off, so I'm gonna wrap this up. But on the other end is uplifting all of the examples of self-determined neighborhood economic, cultural and economic development. Because the point is, and this is me as a storyteller grounding this point, the point is many of us are doing awesome, amazing, transformative work, yet the stories of these wins are not widely distributed or disseminated yet. And sometimes the way we tell stories just ain't sexy. So for me, this is about creating a platform, yes, to name all of the institutional, structural, socio-political, and socioeconomic violence that has created the peculiar circumstances that we're working in, and at the exact same time to uplift all of the mighty, beautiful, radiant stories and actors who look like us, of those of us who are the, the 21st century custodians, the 21st century cultural bearers, designers of ancestrally rooted, uh, politically astute environments for our own thrival. Peace. Thank you, Bryce. Finally, we have Shana M. Griffin. Can you share, please, Shana? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I begin, I want to um, also um, follow the tradition um, that has been laid out for us in terms of land acknowledgments. Um, I want to acknowledge that the city of New Orleans exists on land of indigenous people, a site referred to at, by the Choctaw as Bubancha, meaning many languages spoken there, and ancestral lands stewarded by the Chittimacha, the Apakata, the Choctaw, the Homa, the Natchez, and the Tunica. The indigenous people of this region were subjected to the violence of settler colonialism, genocide, forced migration, and land appropriation to make way for the formation of a colonial enterprise and cultural landscape built on the bodies, flesh, and blood of African captives and their descendants. The African burial grounds upon which the city of New Orleans stand of blood, bones, chains, separation, erasure, social death and resistance speaks to the brutality of chattel slavery, labor exploitation, reproductive control, fungibility, and the violence committed against black people. The geographic shifts of forced migration and dislocation, land dispossession, Jane and Jim Crow policies and structures of confinement are the backdrop upon which displacement occurs and is perpetuated daily within the black geographies that make up the city of New Orleans. I would like to use this opportunity right now to invite you all with me to take a moment of silence as I stand in solidarity with the people of Palestine, taking action against the violence of displacement, settler occupation, and the ongoing colonial project of disappearance and erasure taking place as we speak. The colonial theft of Palestinian land and occupation and accompanying military apparatus of the Israeli government sanctioning the forceful removal of Palestinian families from their homelands is yet another reminder of the importance of linking liberation struggles challenging displacement to transnational movements for liberation and freedom. Again, my name is Shana M. Griffin. I would like to thank the Black School and the Center for Book Arts for inviting me to share my work and interdisciplinary practice engaging art as tools, challenging displacement and the multiple forms in which it takes place. I will also like to acknowledge all of the work that has been done to get us here to bring us all together, both the visible and invisible work. 
Um, I am going to start with the premise from which my work is rooted. Sorry, you guys. Um, from the premise from which my work is rooted and the space from which I'm entering the conversation using the Displaced Project as a point of reference and some recent studio work called Displacing Blackness, Cartographies of Violence, Extraction and Disposability. As I discuss the uses of book arts, historical inquiry and activism as sites of engagement and intervention. Um, as previously noted by um, Shani, I am the founder of Punctue, a feminist research art and activist initiative based here in New Orleans. The mission of Punctuate is to disrupt ideological policies and practices of control, punishment, and disposability through engaged research, art, activism, and spatial imaginaries that center the epistemologies and practices of Black feminist thought to build socially and economically just communities. Punctuate is a vision, a strategy, a practice, a goal, an action, and a site of resistance, possibilities, and reimagined futures. Part of this vision is the Displaced Project. Displaced Project centers um, the history and violent formation of the city of New Orleans. When most people think of the city of New Orleans, they think of images like this, or this, and this, or the food, or black masking traditions. Rarely do people think of images like this. R is aware of images like this. This is an 1849 map of the city of New Orleans with these red Google pinpoints on them, noting the various places where people was bought and sold in the city. I'm showing this image here because it is a historical marker of confinement and displacement. A reminder that displacement is not a new phenomenon or a spatial one. After 1803, with the abolition of the international slave trade, the New Orleans became the largest slave trading port in North America, as some historians would say, others would say simply in the United States. In the city, people was bought and sold as indicated in these points. I don't know if y'all can see my cursor here. This is what we refer to as the CBD, the Central Business District. At the time, this was referred to as the financial district of the city. This is the historical French Quarter where you see municipalities one, two, and three. And here, this is a cluster, um, what is referred to as Espinay Avenue or the Marini neighborhood. Um, people were sold not in a typical fashion in most Southern cities and on an auction block. People were sold in hotels, banks, churches, public schools, theaters, markets, cotton exchanges, hospitals, public buildings, private homes, slave pens, slave depots, slave dungeons on the sidewalks. I'm bringing our attention here um, as Clyde Woods and Catherine McKidrick notes in Black Geographies in the Politics of Place, space is occupied by the colonized, the enslaved, the incarcerated, and the disposed. So when we're talking about, or when I'm talking about displacement, it is important that we both acknowledge and interrogate the historical and contemporary forms in which um, displacement occurs um, and the various ways in which it takes place in shape. Three, I forgot to mention you guys that I will be doing this in five parts. We're in part three, displace. Initially created as a timeline examining the intersections of racial and reproductive violence in housing policies and neighborhood development, displace as a feminist initiative has evolved to include an interactive timeline a multimedia public history project tracing the geographies of Black displacement, dislocation, confinement, and land use planning, housing policies, and urban development. This, you guys, is what I'm showing you is one of my early, early days um, research combining um, using a chart to identify the political economy of reproductive violence and its association with housing policy. Sorry about that. So just wanna point out these top two really quickly. When we think about the US policy period under colonialism, the reproductive policy was genocidal. If you can gain control of indigenous, uh, control the reproductive capabilities of indigenous people, um, that policy is all about genocidal and a housing policy accompanying that is settler colonialism. 
The same is true when we think about slavery. The reproductive policy is exploitative because you are controlling the reproductive capabilities of a people, breeding people to build empire, breeding people for the production of property. The housing policy that accompanies exploitative is plantation arrangements and residential confinement. Um, it continues to this day, no one thing stops while another one starts, one just become more dominant. So colonialism as we know it is an ongoing project, the same will be stated for slavery. Again, as I mentioned, this initially, this place project was initially created as a timeline. This was the first timeline, as you can see, I started off in the 1930s to the 1910s, 2010s. Um, and it went from a one page timeline to this little interesting timeline. Again, that emphasis was on the 1930s to the um, 2010s. And I have since changed it. The timeline actually starts in 1682 up into this present day. This one page timeline has evolved into a 16 page timeline. Um, the Displaced Project um, illustrates historical and contemporary forms of property led development and the property value of white social identity through policies of disposability, divestment, slum clearance, urban renewal, privatization of public services. The Displaced Project narrates the spatialization of race and gender in land use planning and development. As I stated, beginning with the formation of New Orleans and its cartographies of violence, racial slavery, and settler colonialism, the Displaced Project illustrates um, this, this investment um, in the white social identity and is enshrined and codified in law. Here you can see the displaced project. I'm sorry, I use um, critical research methods with activism and art to raise awareness of the multiple ways, the multiple ways in which the violence of displacement takes place in shape in black life. And I explore how housing policies reproduces spatial violence, subjectivity and removal. Um, these are just some images of the Displaced Project, their 16 page timeline. It includes a walking tour, a lecture series, there's these zines, um, there's collaborations, there's also a forthcoming interactive website, atlas and exhibition, and hopefully a space. Um, the Displaced Project is designed um, to create a more just and liberatory future by interrogating our understanding of displacement to include extraction and dislocation, erasure, confinement, the most disposability, policing, criminalization, and disappearance. The project asks, how do we disrupt historical patterns of black displacement? How do we challenge hidden explicit forms of sexual and reproductive violence and housing policies? And one of the most important questions I ask is, is it possible to create housing policies that do not reinforce carceral landscape and colonial imaginaries? This is a big one, you guys. Um, most recently, I had an opportunity at the Contemporary Art Center um, working on um, uh, imagining what a visual representations of the Displaced Project would look like as an exhibition. Here, I am bringing your attention to some art that was part of Displacing Blackness, Cartographies of Violence, Extraction, and Disposability. Um, from abstract um, artwork depicting the violent screams of bondage and dispossession to the recreation of a federal housing office where policymakers created urban divestment and exclusionary mortgage underwriting policies to personal narratives of displacement and honoring black women organizing in public housing. Displacing blackness examined in multiple ways in which again displacement takes place in shape in black life. So as you can see from those illustrations, um, I'm gonna go back, but I wanna I'm gonna go back and forward um, in a second. But I, as you can see here, I am, am using um, the Displaced Project and creating these visualizations. I am truly centering book art in the process. Here you can see books show up here and here and there. And then there are these other creative ways. The reason why I'm emphasizing the underwriting manual here, you can see right here, there's this redlining map of New Orleans. I decided to de-emphasize the map of New Orleans and instead put an emphasis on the underwriting manual um, that was produced in the 1936 by the Federal Housing Administration. It is because of this book here, less so of this map here that many of us often engage in, is why the racial wealth gap of the United States exists the way it does. Um, it's because it is basic, boring, unsophisticated looking book. 
Um, it is hard to find any copies of the underwriting manual. Um, so I recreated them. I created 20 copies of this book um, and built them out and had them put in the um, exhibition space. Um, one thing to note is when we talk about redlining maps, they were actually called residential security district maps created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation in the 19, late 19, mid, I should say mid 1930s. 239 maps was created um, across the United States. Um, here, these are copies and I'm also gonna demonstrate these are zines. They're the size of a passport. Um, I modeled them after a project that was done by this amazing artist named Sharita Town. Um, this one is called Displacing Blackness. I don't know if y'all can see, but there's black on black ink. Um, there's the 16 page timeline. Again, that's there. You can see how a lot of work there is. Um, here's in hand copy of the underwriting manual. And then also here, sorry. Oh, I don't have it, but copies of theirs was a movement without marches. I showed it on some of the previous slides. Um, the emphasis on um, this artwork is, is, to, is about creating all the engagement points, um, engaging um, stories and narratives around displacement um, is not enough. How, what are some other creative ways of bringing people in? I'm showing you images of um, some people here. These are housing officials with the local public housing authority here in the city, along with some HUD officials engaging in this work. Here I am standing next to Jason Williams, the DA of the city of New Orleans, alongside right here, this gentleman on the side here is my twin brother. And this is the DA, I'm walking him through um, the Displacing Blackness um, showcase of my studio work. And here I'm pointing out, you can see I'm, I love to use the finger, you guys. I'm pointing out the importance to the DA about the importance of why um, understanding displacement is not just about um, removing people from their home or evicting them, how the displacement is directly tied to dispossession, erasure, and blame. Blame is really key because once we blame a community for problems that they did not commit, then we can justify their mistreatment through policing, surveillance, criminalization, and eventual disappearance. I respectfully told Jason, um, our DA is just like, Jason, this is why we need people like you in office with a radical agenda to intervene and stop such policing and unnecessary policing, policing of our communities. Um, with that, I would just as a quick recap, just want to state again, um, you know, as a feminist activist, an abolitionist, a sociologist, and a co-founder of the first community land trust in the city of New Orleans, I learned early on creating affordable housing is not enough, especially in a city and a state where you can evict people within with less than in less than ten days, uh, because our housing um, tenant right laws have not changed in nearly two hundred years. Um, the housing laws of Louisiana was created in 1825 when New Orleans was the largest trading, safe trading port in the country. Other strategies are needed. In addition to creating permanent affordable housing through land trust, uh, we have to engage in other ways. And, and using art as one site, I want to emphasize too, art is not always the catalyst that we often think it is. Sometimes art is often used to gentrify and displace communities. And how are we doing just the opposite? and using book art as an opportunity to do such thing, creating multiple engagement points. I can bring people in, I can bring the DA in to the Contemporary Art Center to talk about displacement in the same ways I can honor the experiences of black women who organized decades long in public housing, where they are able to see themselves um, in this work and also see how their activism is being honored. Also, I can make available um, this giant boring book to housing advocates um, who um, can see why their work exists the way it exists because of policies like this that are still, the legacies are ongoing. And with that, I will pause for our conversation and questions. Amazing. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna keep saying thank you, but there's so much um, wonderful information presentation so much said and so much not said right in in your individual um introductions um before we get into things too much i want to let the audience know that we are taking questions from you all especially the last 30 minutes so please go ahead and populate the chat with those questions as they come up um, to the panelists i would love to hear you all's questions for each other as you know we have some preset questions that we kind of sent out with the first invitation. 
um, but we're happy for this conversation to, to go where it, where it may. So I have one of those questions in mind as a place to start, but if any of you um, wanna start with one, Shana, you explicitly have questions in, in your presentation. Um, Latasha's been listening, Bryce has been listening, right? Um, if any of you wanna start with a question, we can also begin that way. You know? <laughs> All right, we'll come back. Um, so throughout um, each of your presentations, um, I thought about collaboration, right? All of the additional voices that you all bring into your work, um, all of the additional communities that make the work possible. Um, and so with that, um, what are some ways that creative collaboration and community building practices um, inform the fruition of your projects, of your work, of, of what you've shared with us today. Boom. Um, can jump. Oh. Go ahead, oh. Oh. Me? You? Me. Okay. So um for me, collaboration. Boom. I'm gonna start with the, the idea of scale. Um the issues that have afflicted our people, um, these are issues that occur at scale. Um, they, they're issues that come from a scaled institutional infrastructure, and then they manifest very hyper-locally, seemingly compartmentalized, um, yet 100% connected to this transnational um, shit. So it's more than one person living in our neighborhoods. In order for us to, for me, with integrity, really be doing this work that's designed in service to more than just ourselves, then we have to be doing it with other people. Um, whatever the work looks like for us, even on a basic level of talking to someone else, um, to get more clear on the different, the myriad angles that any particular conversation, in particular this conversation can be approached from. Um, so we'll dot, dot, dot it there so more voices can come on, but just dealing with the scale of it. Like we can't get shit to scale. We can't have scalable solutions if it's just a team of one. Can I ask a can I ask a follow up question, Bryce? Because um, even looking at your presentation, so you showed you you ended with the um, the road close to gentrifier sign, right? Um, and for those who don't know, that sign exists in physical form as well, right? Like that's actually up um, in a neighborhood in Detroit. Could you talk about where it is and and what kind of coalition came together? Um, if if that's how it happened, I believe it is how that coalition well, came together to, um, to get that up. That sign is amazing. So, amazing, absolutely. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, and I'm working to get more up. So the first uh, iteration of the sign was erected in my North End neighborhood. Um, the, now this was coming, how about this? This project is a collaboration in this way thus far. Um, have been working with a couple of people. One is a longtime collaborator, Melinda Anderson an amazing, I mean, remarkable designer, please Google her, but Melinda Anderson um, from Studio M Design in Detroit. I've been working with her um, on the installation side uh, to really, yeah, on the installation side, on the public programming side, to actually do the fabrication and the um, assembly. Um, I've been working with a brother, well, brother, but it's actually a white boy, a white man named um, Ben Wolf. So that's an, a layer to the, the cross-cultural collaborations that do happen and that are, um, yeah, that are somewhat of a norm in the 21st century work, um, just working across class and, and, and race. The short story though, um, it's, it's a small team of us. My collaboration on a coalition level looks like, in my neighborhood in particular, um, it looks like me being a member, okay. Hmm? Okay. a founder of Oakland Avenue Artist Coalition. Yep. Sorry, we, I think we had some tech issue. I think it was us. Okay. 
So keep going. Boom. So as a founder of Oakland Avenue Artists Coalition, um, it's a squad of us. It's like 13 of us since 2013 who have been um, activating properties, stabilizing properties, and really acquiring properties in the last five years. Between us all now, um, as a coalition, we have secured um, in our ownership over 25 parcels, including land and buildings. Um, and we're scaling that up. So my artist coalition, Oakland Avenue Artist Coalition, they trust me and they give me license. We give ourselves license to do us in the neighborhood. Yet we always are, you know what I mean? Touching home base with each other. Like, yo, this is my project. I'm gonna do this shit. I'm gonna put it out in the neighborhood. And it's like, blessing, blessing, you got the blessing? All right, cool. So um, that's one way that that, that kind of coalition-based collaboration looks. Another way that the coalition-based collaboration looks is this. Um, my second sign, or my third sign that was erected because two were erected in the North End, both taken down. One was stolen, the other taken down by the city of Detroit. That's another conversation on violence towards artists, um, especially when we're designing our own environments without permission. Um, so the second collaboration that happened in, the, in, the, in, the, in a Detroit neighborhood was in the Southwest neighborhood. Southwest Detroit is known for being the, the, basically the epicenter of the, the Latinx you know, diaspora. So my partners um, from Southwest Detroit, they are doing a lot of organizing around this um, library in particular, a library that has been a, a, a community asset for 20, 30 years, the city uh, basically stopped funding the library. Um, and then without notice or public conversation, they put the, the library on a private auction list and we're gonna sell it to a, a outside developer. So they reached out to me like, yo B, we would love to get a sign to support our, uh, the mobilizing that we're doing down here. So that was me, even though Bryce had been collaborating with the homies in Southwest since 2011 in a very real way, very deep connected way. It was still me being invited into the neighborhood. Um, I do want to name this too real quick on the way out. Have been living in my current neighborhood, the North End in Detroit since 2011, yet I'm from a neighborhood called University District. So even for me coming over here for the first time in 2009 to, to help um, with the urban gardening, gardening initiative, Bryce still approached another Detroit neighborhood as if Bryce is an outsider. Like not assuming that just because we're all from the same city that each one of our, the cultures of our neighborhoods are exactly the same or like homogenous. So this notion of, um, this, this, the notion of self-awareness when it comes to entering a space, that does apply to black people entering other black neighbors in your, I mean, black neighborhoods in your own city as well. Um, so just want to put that out there, dot, 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 back to y'all. <laughs> yeah. Um, Shana, you had, oh, mm -hmm. no, no, well, no, can, no, can we uh, see what Shana had to say in response to the question? Uh, and then we're going to come to you, Latasha, sorry. Okay. Oh, so um, I was actually. Um, oh, should we restate the original question before we go in? Uh, what are the ways that creative collaboration and community building practices inform the fruition of your project? Yeah, so thank you, Joseph, for restating that question. And I feel like the collaborations piece is also directly connected to um, what inspired the formation of the project in and of itself. For me, the work of the Displaced Project is a reflection of who I am. I grew up in public housing here in the city in a neighborhood that was uh, segregated, actually a segregated public housing development that was initially created for white residents. And then it became integrated and then it became predominantly black by the late seventies becoming um, majority poor, headed by women and over police. Uh, and the criminalization and the location of the neighborhood was no accident as it started with displacement. And so for me, it's really important that I center myself and my experience um, and that of the communities from which I come from in the work itself. And because of that, that makes collaborations much more, um, makes collaboration not just possible, but more authentic um, and um, foundational. 
for anything else that comes as a result. And so having that background, having, you know, being a formal um, resident of public housing, formerly working for the local housing authority, starting the first community land trust in the city, um, and starting some other initiatives that's equally as important, um, those collaborations are being informed by the lived experience, not someone that's coming in or parachuting in saying what they think the neighborhood or any community should look like. Um, also, because I'm thinking about collaborations, um, both in terms of research as well, uh, as, well as with um, other organizations, um, housing rights groups, and um, um, I'm sorry, not just housing rights groups, um, and, how, and they know housing rights groups as those who are advocating and engaged in abolitionist work, um, because there's many different forms of housing that we should be advocating for and challenging and recognizing prisons as a form of housing and what a government does a very good job of warehousing people in and that's not the type of housing that we want. And prisons also represent another form of displacement. And so engaging folks doing intersectional work, whether that's in terms of prisons, housing advocacy, healthcare, education, climate and the environment. Um, when I'm engaging in conversations around displacement, is it necessitates deeper conversations that brings that that is bringing in other sectors in, and it's not just seen simply as just an issue of gentrification. Otherwise, people engage gentrification as if it's something that is happening in a moment, and not looking at the historical trajectory that got us here in the first place. And so, for me, displacement offers a much more stronger. Uh, much more engaging, um, so like framework, um, basically tracing the past into the present as we reimagine the future in the now. And so for me, those collaborations have taken many different forms from co-writing reports with um, the um, local housing rights groups to attorneys, um, different law clinics, um, to partnering with um, women's health clinics, abolitionist-based groups, um, education groups and art-based groups. So I feel like the collaborations are very strong, but in terms of the artists who are working on this work um, have to see themselves in the work and be connected to the issues um, that we're talking about. Otherwise, um, it makes our accountability pretty fraught. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Natasha. <laughs> Thank you. Um, collaborations, I, I think um, that's, that's not the word I would use for how I'm documenting uh, the situation as it stands right now. And, and, and I say focusing solely on my block, because as you know, Harlem is one of many different neighborhoods, many different communities. Um, and so what I see and what I feel in my neighborhood is very different from what someone might see over in East Harlem. Um, and also it's a thing of giving myself permission, but also asking for permission uh, simply to have conversations with people. So I think if, if there's any form of collaboration that's being had, it's the relationships I have with neighbors, the, na the relationships that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to maintain and retain um, for those dwindling numbers of folks who are still in the neighborhood and those who come back to the neighborhood like Miss Martha who suffers from dementia. Um, future collaborations is a big question mark, right? Because um, it's a conversation that I'm having now with the photographer Isaac Diggs who you saw two of the images in my um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, Isaac Dix did live in Harlem at one point, but I believe he was priced out and now he lives in Atlanta. Um, um, and uh, when my building was sold, there was a huge white flight, believe it or not, because you know already that my, my building was majority occupied by white people, right? So we have to think of the various stages of white mobility in neighborhoods, right? And that, you know, these white people basically get displaced because the owner is somewhere else and wanted them out. So it's a it's an interesting thing how that happens, how the shifts happen. And where I live right now, the photographs that you see of those vacant apartments 
of those vacant shells are literally right next door to me because Shani knows I'm the only person on that floor and one of only three people living in that entire building. And it's a 21 unit building. So we're living and experiencing something that's very surreal, very quiet, very violent. Um, and uh, unstable, you know? And for me, this project, if I wanna call it a project, uh, Depesh Padma asked a question about initiatives for each of the panelists. Um, are they doing funding? I'm not doing funding any, any right now because right now I'm just writing, I'm just documenting. Uh, I, I, I can't present this as a project yet. Um, within that scope, within the definition, when we, you know, we look for granting grants and funding for a project. I can't look at it that way. It's something that I'm living right now and something that I just need to document for my own personal sanity. Um, to shift a bit, thank y'all for that. Um, to shift a bit, um, I think we already, talked about this a little bit, but I want to ask the question so we all can share, um, or you all can share. Uh, what are the legacies that are informing your work? Which is like three very different approaches. So I'm wondering if like, is there precedents that y'all are following in? Um, are y'all kind of like just figuring it out as you go? Natasha just said, this is like, very personal, but is there like kind of a personal precedent, precedent or antecedent that led you to this practice of documentation? Um, so I, I would think there's two things, and I mean, I rarely do this, but I have to say, I kind of uh, was thinking a lot about Langston Hughes' Be Simple, um, uh, because that character that he created allowed for the local voice to tell the story, to tell you all of the various characters and layers of complexities that are not always black and white on the streets, right? The scenarios. So that was something I thought a lot about, but then I also thought a lot about a publication that came out some 20, 30 years ago about a woman who was documenting the displacement and gentrification of Lower East Side. And um, something very similar to what I'm going through, she documented the destruction and demolition of apartments around her um, through photography and narrative. And I do not remember her name, but that was something that I definitely thought a lot about and also, um, that's it, I'll stop right there. Shana or Bryce, the, the, to restate, what are the legacies that are informing your work? So for me, one legacy is the legacy of matriarchs of Black matriarchs in Detroit um, doing movement work. So even though Bryce clearly is not in a woman's body in this lifetime, um, the matriarchs for me are mothers. Like those are our mothers. Those are Detroit's movement mothers. Um, they're multi-generational. Yet it's this legacy of making space for other people to enter a conversation at whatever point on the spec whatever the spectrum of engagement is, whatever point that that person may be on, but making space for any and everybody to enter the conversation um, and not only be able to like be a witness to the conversation, but actually design a way for them to be um, and do within that container. So that's a real legacy, like creating spaces creating containers for certain type of work to be done. Another legacy that informs me, which does come from one of our uh, beloved Detroit movement matriarchs, Charity Hicks, 
is the legacy of the movement legacy of waging love or prioritizing the interpersonal relationship as the fundamental um, asset in movement building. So this, for me, this whole work is about, it's about being, uplifting a collective identity, a familial village point of identity, uplifting that and in doing so, uh, telling ourselves stories that more deeply connect us um, to this place, space, the neighborhood as mother, the neighborhood as the womb space that cultivates and develops not only individuals, but develops families, as well as cultural practices and economies. Um, but it's, it's the legacy of, of diasporic African matriarchness that really my work is rooted in, for real, for real. Um, Joseph, thank you for the question. It's pretty layered and heavy. So in terms of legacies, there's multiple. I'm gonna just keep it to just two or three versus the legacies of slavery, thinking about racial slavery in this afterlife and what does it look like in contemporary and its various manifestations and how do we go from slave ships and auction blocks, uh, sharecropping to residential segregation, urban renewal, carcerality, polluting environments and you know everyday displacement and violence. That's one piece. So we're thinking about those legacies and this ongoing realities in our lives. Two, um, thinking about um, the middle passage is another um, sort of like legacy of how we got to uh, where we are and the importance of engaging the archives and documentation and creating real living archives, um, both the silences that exist within archives as well as the violences, right? There are things that we seek that we cannot find um, but then there are things that we can pull together. And so excavating that um, documentation is really key, whether we're documenting the personal um, and building that out. I think a lot about the Displaced Project and um, in the work that I was doing back in, like immediately right after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, um, you know, engaging in a lot of anti-violence work and thinking deeply how the work that I was doing in terms of um, organizing with critical resistance and organizing with insight challenging the different ways and forms of gender-based violence coupled with um, advocating for prison abolition and recognizing there were some movement contradictions at play. Um, our primary strategies of keeping people safe um, in mainstream is to call the cops, where we know the cops don't provide safety, but when there are consequences, it's men of color who are primarily held accountable. Uh, but then doing anti-prison um, abolition work, recognizing there are ways in which we don't talk about gender-based violence. And then or I'm starting a women's health clinic after Katrina, seeing some of those same contradictions emerge themselves. When we think about anti-violence work, there's no true, um, I would say there's no real incentive uh, to divest from law enforcement because that's where your primary, your funding is coming from. Um, and the same in terms of feminist health clinics, a lot of the funding is coming from the Office of Population through Title 10 under family planning. The vast majority of your funding is coming from his family planning based work. So there's no true incentive to critique sterilization and dangerous forms of contraception. And doing this work, I realized the same communities that were ex you know, excessively targeted for repro dangerous forms of reproductive um, technologies and control and sterilization are also the same communities of women who are over police, women and queer folks who are over police um, and coming from communities where they're experiencing higher rates of displacement and terminal lack of housing security. And to me, that was the start. That was their legacy, being able to identify reproductive control through slavery to reproductive control in the contemporary and send housing policies as one form of such. Um, and then what does that, how we're manifesting that in the work. And I feel like the documentation is really important. Even if you don't even recognize why you're documenting it, just document, taking photos, recording, um, oral histories, um, even with our notes, just preserving as much as we can. I'm not advocating for becoming a hoarder, but have you should organize because you don't know how it may show up. In 2012, I snuck into the projects right before it was being torn down, the Aboriginal Public Housing Development with my twin brother. And we were able, we took um, some mailboxes, my family mailbox. Eight years later, the mailboxes show up in my studio work, um, unplanned, but it was the only thing that was left 
The building that I spent 23 years of my life was torn down. Um, there was nothing left but these mailboxes. Um, I, had a, I thought about completely forgot to add this picture of my sister. She's like literally sitting on these bricks that I had in the um, at the Contemporary Art Center. And a friend of mine was like, oh my gosh, she's sitting on the art. I'm like, she's not sitting on art, she's sitting on bricks. For her, that's the stoop, that's home. That's all that is left, right? And so the importance of that documentation is key. How are we documenting ourselves? How are we making an ungeographic, geographical? Um, how are we bring it into and acknowledging these um, different horrific forms of violence? And not only do are we documenting, how are we using this documentation to transform um, our experiences in the moment? Um, what are the uses? How can we use them as a catalyzing moment to engage different audiences and different communities and publics in our work? So I think that's really key in terms of those legacies. They're ongoing. Joe said you're a minimalist, Shana, but you're telling me to hoard more. I didn't call you. <laughs> I didn't call you a minimalist because I've been in your spare room. <laughs> so I know what lies beneath the minimalist. <laughs> in the laundry out on the um, house, but, but also how are we, um, the things that we're collecting and documenting and preserving, how are we organizing it? Um, yeah. How are we utilizing it? You know, it's almost like when we think about cell phones, we take hundreds of, we could take hundreds of photos. How many are we actually gonna use, right? And going through them, preserving what we need and discarding the rest if it's not necessary, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it's like, how are we being strategic in our uses? But the question is, why? Why are we documenting it? To what extent? It goes back to thinking about old school forms of organizing and relationship building. Who are we building those relationships with? Why are we building those relationships? And to what extent? What is the end goal? What are the means by which we're doing this work? We're not collecting for the sake of simply collecting. And we also understand that that's one of the dangers of displacement is erasure. I see what's going on between you two, but I'm gonna pause on that. But no, one I didn't mean, I didn't mean to, you know, I was just yeah, sure. a a moment, moment of levity, <laughs> yeah, a moment it. of levity. You are, you are, you are deeply hurt and felt and, and really to that point of like, what is the end goal, right? Mm -hmm. We have um, about six minutes left and I wanted to kind of pivot from this okay, question more, about, sure. Yeah, one more comment in terms of thinking about what Latasha said, that to me, one of the dangers of displacement is erasure. When we think about when I started off with thinking about the middle passage and legacies of slavery, it assumes that we came from nothing, right? And so even we think about right now, even with, you know, when I, when I refer to as social displacement, when you have a bistro that was once a washeteria or a corner store, the building is still there, but its social use have changed, right? Displacement erases all of that history prior to that point. As a people, um, our experiences are often and histories are often erased, assuming that we came from nothing. And that's one of the dangers of displacement and that's why we have to document and challenge those narratives and not engage in revisionist history. And I would also add spatial erasure is just as painful oh, right? and traumatic to the experience. Uh, the last image you saw by Isaac of the building being constructed, there was a church there. No one will ever know that that was a church. All you will see is this very tall, ugly building, but no one will know that, especially if you're not of the neighborhood. Yes. And that revisionist history, I feel like is important because once, and those who do, re, you know, remember how we bear in witness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so otherwise when we don't remember and as a reminder and we resist those revisionist ways of engaging, we're also challenging the blame and in the policing. So it's funny also how like this, this capitalist system is like savvy and they'll erase, they'll erase a space that's been like, you know, a cornerstone of the neighborhood. And then they'll put up like the reclaimed wood. So it's like this facade of a history, but there's no history in this space is not for the people who use say the, the, the laundromat, like they're not welcome. Mm -hmm. or, we, or we take the name of that place um, and rename it with a prominent African-American or black figure, right? Um, that had nothing to do with the displacement of that neighborhood, but all of a sudden their name is on it. Or we hire some artists in the community to do some a public mural, right? Mm -hmm. um, it 
employed and the artist needs to have paid work and then the, to legitimize the destruction that took place and the violence. Yeah, Latasha talked about Alison Starr's Harriet Tubman statue in Harlem, which is, is beautiful and like uh, a breath what? of fresh air in that gentrifying space. But across the street, there, there's Harriet Tubman Gardens condominium. Right. Mm -hmm. And a block street. away from it is a police precinct. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't even make it up. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'd like to name something real quick on the displacement side. So a big thing for me um, around displacement in my work and conversations is the economic displacement that happened. So in Detroit, we, after 1974, when for the first time we had a black mayor, I say to the ancestor, Coleman Alexander Young. Um, but yeah, so we had a black mayor for the first time between 1974 and 1994. There was this period, basically 20 years, where for the first time in Detroit, we have legislation that supports a now majority black city. Um, one of the things, though, that was going on for me in my lifetime um, around the displacement conversation was first seeing plants close down. So the, the announcements of 10,000 um, workers are gonna get laid off, blah, 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 1,000 ping slips are happening. And then from that, those jobs being sent overseas, that is what led to the inability to maintain your home. And then now the architectural displacement, because you have to leave your built environment and go someplace else when the more and more the people leave because of their jobs literally being displaced, then um, you begin to lose and displace the actual cultural identities and the cultural behaviors. So just for me naming that the economic displacement in the latter 20th century, from my view has been the thing that has been spurring um, the physical displacement. Um, so just naming that displacement happens on a socio-political and economic level, like first erasing legislation, you know what I mean? Like we actually had legislation taken off the books that Coleman Young's administration had put on. And I'm sure like in Jackson, Mississippi, certain um, things similar happen with uh, Ashe Chokwe Lumumba, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. The displacement does have different manifestations, economic, architectural, as well as cultural. Yeah, there's many more forms that what you take. Thanks so much, Bryce, right on on that. Okay, um, I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, we are scheduled to wrap it up in one minute, but if we could, I would also love to close on, on maybe just one or two thoughts to, to a question, which is on, um, you know, what, what futurity and potential exists for solidarity work between distant locations, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking about the, the ancestors, the legacies that inform you all, the whole idea for this conversation series is to take those histories, process them in the work that's being done right now and share it back with people joining into these calls. Thank you everyone joining into these calls. You can tell from the chat that people in these calls are, are genuinely engaged in the topics, right? And share back lessons that can inform us all in, in ways to move forward. So on the action tip, right, on the, on the what, what, is, what is the end goal um, idea, um, and I think some of these ideas kind of came up in our in our tech in our tech uh, rehearsal yesterday. Um, but if anybody wants to share any ideas um, that maybe come out of this conversation, potential for solidarity work between distant locations. One tagline of mine that was shoot out here is, "It is trans local transnational solidarity that will." produce hyper-local solutions. Um, so just, that's, that's a very grounding um, point for me. So just affirming that us right now, we are, we're acknowledging boom, capitalism has gone global um, for the past 20 years. So that has allowed us to see the bigger machine or the bigger apparatus, um, which the tentacles that we were in the past naming like the tentacle is the whole body. No, in fact, it's a tentacle. And we're able to see the whole body now because of the globalism of capitalism and in that the technology that has brought us forward, I mean, brought us together 
um, on the communication side. So we're able to actually interact in real time and share stories and strategies um, in real time. So that, that's my thing. Um, yes, please. Yeah, so I think um, there are so many, I mean, I think a lot has already been shared already in terms of opportunities for solidarity um, and um, uh, movement work across different locales um, and scales, um, both domestically and also transnationally. Um, I also think that there are great opportunities of sharing um, ideas and templates in terms of documentation. Um, how we're recording the information, how we're sharing out. Um, I also think there are opportunities how we are engaging and using art, book art specifically as forms of intervention. Um, also reimagining what publications can look like um, going beyond just the bounded page. Um, thinking about what you share, um, Bryce, in terms of the science, like the uses of strong words, um, even t-shirts as walking billboards. Also thinking about the ways in which we are using photography to document and to record what once was um, and um, stories. Um, I engage memory a lot as part of my practice, um, history, memory, and timelines. And so not just documenting the timelines of what has occurred, also creating a new type of timeline in terms of what we want to manifest and what we want to see. Also last, I think combining our various art practices with actual activism and research um, and what that can produce, um, and also how are we owning the research, what is make, and also how we make it participatory, and the residents who we are working with, how they are also equal owners in that project, um, and the information that is, um, uh, I would say, archived. And also reimagine what the archives can look like, not just something that you go into a sterile building and request a box to go through, right? Like there are living archives, there are different ways, and, and seeing archives also as a bridge, an opportunity. Um, as a site of possibility that I think is really important. Um, I'm going to speak, uh, I'm going to try to speak briefly um, solely with the Harlem community and the wider New York City community. Um, I think that one, um, artists, whether their work is socially engaged or not, uh, need to start having conversations with each other as well as their neighbors. Um, we need some humanity in this topic. We need some generosity. We need some humbleness. Uh, we need some empathy. Um, we need artists to uh, run for city office for various different things so that the conversation can be had. Um, we need to have uh, a direct line with organizations like Palante, People Against Landlord Abuse and Tenant Exploitation, Met Housel, Housing Council and Tenants and Neighbors, which is all located in New York City so that we understand what they're fighting for as artists, because I believe that, uh, also this thing that has to do with displacement oftentimes, and Bryce uh, touched on this earlier, that um, oftentimes uh, real estate follows the artists and the artist um, uh, unconsciously becomes the result of a displacement of a neighborhood in a community. And um, when you have artists, uh, artists need to understand that that's very pre prevalent. And also artists need to understand that, understand particularly in New York City, right? I'm only talking about New York City, rent stabilization and rent control, right? Many of our friends may not have those two status. They may be paying real market, but they need to understand why rent stabilization and rent control needs to remain, right? And many of them don't know. Um, I think also we need to have a broader conversation that, that reaches within New York City 
uh, Harlem, East Harlem, Central Harlem, Flushing, Sunset Park, Jackson Heights, Bensonhurst, Woodside, uh, Woodside, we need to have conversations somehow and really, really, really start learning from each other and having conversations with the various Asian communities within New York City, within, with, with the various Caribbean, Spanish, French, English, Dutch speaking communities in the city, um, with the various indigenous to North America communities in New York City uh, to understand just how easy displacement can happen within a city. Um, and then we can make some art. Amen, Asha. Asha, um, you made me cry. Thank y'all. Um, yeah, this was this. I'm just really grateful. Um, this is this is being archived. Um, it'll be um, on YouTube, easily accessible for people to find. So I hope it can be a resource um, for folks going forward uh, on the topic of archive that's been throughout today. Next week, we're speaking um, with um, Black photographers about photography and self determination. Um, and we're just so grateful for you all um, as human beings um, for reflections of your projects and your lives, right? These have been such personal um, and necessary mm -hmm. um, shares and conversations and we're just grateful. Um, we keep on, we send you all love and energy and in, in all the work you're doing. Thank y'all, oh, appreciate it. Big, big up y'all too for um, your work and doing the school down there, like that's, 100% one of these new narratives that must be uplifted. You know what I mean? Bringing things into the architect and environment, culturally relevant. So shout out y'all too, and for this panel. Yeah. Doing our best, doing our research, Ms. Dig. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank y'all. Thank y'all, have a good one. Everybody have a good Wednesday, peace. Peace. So we're all going off? Yeah.